June 6th, 1944, the day that changed the war in the war that changed the world. It was the day of the long-awaited invasion of Northwest Europe by Allied forces. Years of planning a direct attack on Germany's fortress Europe was finally executed on the beaches of Normandy, France by American, British, and Canadian forces. It was the largest amphibious invasion in all of human history. Over 150,000 soldiers, 6,000 ships and boats, 11,000 airplanes, and 50,000 vehicles crossing the English Channel, coming ashore, and landing in France in one day. Less than a year later, the war in Europe was over and Hitler was dead. How did the Allies manage it? What were they up against? What was it like to be there on that day? Why does it matter to us now? Stay tuned. All of these questions will be answered in the 75th anniversary of D-Day electronic field trip. Welcome to today's special electronic field trip. We're broadcasting live from the National World War II Museum in New Orleans into thousands of classrooms across North America and Europe. We're so excited to have you join us from your school near the 75th anniversary of this critical invasion, D-Day. I'm Commander Damon Singleton, meteorologist and retired Naval officer. This program is brought to you through the generosity of the museum's donors, presented by the Kane Foundation with additional support from the Lupo Family Fund and Dale E. and Janice Davis Johnson Family Foundation. In fact, you'll see an oral history from World War II veteran and former president of the Kane Foundation, Frank Denius, during this broadcast. Today, the story will be brought to you by our four excellent student reporters in the field. Michael from the United States, Wiley from Canada, Lucy from the United Kingdom, and Angie from France. They will represent each of their countries as they uncover the history behind Operation Overlord. This program is designed to be interactive, you won't just be watching, but take part in the discussion about D-Day, including asking questions live of museum's vice president, Colonel Peter Crane. If you're watching on the museum's website, you can ask questions and answer polls in the box directly below the screen, or you can go to slido.com and type in the code hashtag 1944 to join in the conversation. Captioning of this program in English and French is also available below. And a quick note to viewers, please be advised there are graphic images in this program including war violence that may be upsetting to some participants. To start off our journey, let's join Michael in the museum's Louisiana Memorial Pavilion to learn a bit more about a critical piece of equipment for D-Day. But first, let's check out the opening poll question. What does the D in D-Day stand for? Your choices are A, doom, B, death, C, division, or D, it doesn't stand for anything. With that, take it away, Michael. Beginning our journey today at the National World War II Museum beside one of our most important artifacts. With me is museum educator Chrissy Gregg. Michael, thank you so much for joining me here today at the museum. We are standing next to this iconic Higgins boat, also known as an LCVP, Landing Craft for Vehicle Personnel. Uh, 13,000 of these boats were built right here in New Orleans during World War II. It has kind of a unique design. If you notice, this front here is actually a ramp. Why would a boat need a ramp? Maybe to assist unloading a Jeep or a truck? Yeah, exactly. The V in uh, LCVP is vehicle, and actually the P is personnel. So it wasn't just uh, vehicles, but also people. Uh, this boat is actually based off of boats that were used uh, here in the Louisiana bayous to get through the shallow swamp water. So actually, this boat could go all the way to a beach without getting stuck. You lower down the ramp, and you could just run right off or take the equipment right off of it. Weren't thousands of these used in the D-Day operation? Yeah, thousands of these were used in D-Day. Um, and they were just one small piece of the huge operation and all of the boats and ships that would cross the channel on June 6, 1944. Uh, D-Day is important for a lot of reasons, one of them being that it is the largest amphibious invasion in all of human history. So this Higgins boat is important, but it's one small piece of this humongous puzzle. It's a big job. Yeah, seriously, it is a big job, and it required a lot of planning and a lot of uh, strategy. 
It required 12 allied nations all working together, really years, but especially a few intense months of planning. A really awesome allied deception campaign. Um, it required 156,000 troops, 6,400 ships and boats, 11,000 airplanes, all in one day. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy, right? Yes. So uh, today you have a big job. Uh, you are going to be learning all about D-Day. And uh, you're not just gonna be doing that here in New Orleans. I'm actually sending you on a bit of a trip. <laughs> so awesome. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> uh, so actually you're gonna be going off to England oh, wow. first and you're going to be meeting some other students and you guys will be learning all about the planning and strategy behind D-Day because a lot of it happened there. Then you're gonna cross the channel just like they did so many years ago and land in France and you're gonna meet another French student and you'll be exploring all of the sites of Normandy to really understand what's important about D-Day and why we remember it 75 years later. So uh, I guess pack your bags, uh, bon voyage. Okay. <laughs> Today I've arrived in southern England, traveling over 4,500 miles to understand how the Allies put off such a massive invasion. I'll be joined by Wiley from Canada and Lucy from the UK. Our countries were key allies and our teamwork and strategic planning led to a successful operation. Hi Michael, nice to meet you. I'm Lucy, I live in Southsea. So nice to meet you Lucy. How was your flight? Eh, it was alright, but I'm glad to be back on the ground here with y'all in England. In fact, I met Wiley, our senior reporter from Canada, on the plane. She was telling me all about Canada's involvement in World War II, and she should be here. Hi everyone, I'm Wiley and I'm from Ontario. I was telling Michael a little bit about the war last night. So basically, in an official capacity, the war began in 1939 for the UK and Canada. The UK declared war against Hitler on September 3rd, and the Canadian Parliament did the same on September 10th. This was actually the only time Canada has ever declared a state of war. This occurred two years before the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, which marked the U.S.'s entrance into World War II. Flash forward 1944. Most of the plans for D-Day took place in London over the course of the years. However, we're not in London. Actually, the place we're in could have been more different to the bustling city. Believe it or not, this quaint and sleepy village of Suffolk was critical to the finalising plans of Operation Overlord. Really? That's interesting. As the Allies were nearing the intended invasion date, the primary commanders desired to be closer to the ports in southern England where thousands of Allied soldiers, airmen and sailors, along with the necessary supplies and equipment, would launch. The Manor House, which is just shown behind us, held some of the key meetings in the 11th hour with World War II's famous military leadership. Do you guys want to go inside and take a look? Sure. sure. This beautiful house and the surrounding grounds were the headquarters of Operation Neptune the naval component of Overlord under Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey. It was from this house that General Dwight Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander, would give the order to begin the liberation of Northwest Europe. Right now, I'm standing in the home's drawing room, which during the war was turned into a map room for senior commanders. Behind me is the original map that helped plan D-Day, and with me is the curator, Richard Callahan. Hello, Richard. Hi, oh, pleased to meet you. Welcome to the map room here at Southwark House. So Richard, what exactly was this map used for? Well, this is actually the show and tell of Operation Neptune, the naval part of the Overlord landings. Can you describe the scene around here leading up to the D-Day invasion? It's probably best described as studied chaos. There were 6,000 people in the high command, but very few of them actually had access to this house. The majority were camped just outside in the woods. But within the house itself, there were probably about 50 people all running around doing their separate jobs. The house itself was the most secret room in southern England, if not in the Western world. This was where the important decision as to when and where we go in the Normandy landings was taken. What important decisions were made here in the house? The biggest two decisions were actually completely at odds with each other. The first decision was, do we go or do we stay? The hero of D-Day was a man called James Stagg. He was a weatherman, and every day he would predict the weather, and that would be tested against what the weather was like two days later. And for the whole of May, Stagg's predictions were perfect. He's coming up to the biggest decision he has to make. D-Day is set for the 5th of June. 
On the fourth, he tells Eisenhower on a beautiful summer day that he'll have to postpone. There's a storm coming. The next day, that storm arrives. Eisenhower listens to experts. He's taken the decision. He will postpone the landings by 24 hours. Stagg has better news. He tells the Supreme Commander there is an interval with the weather. It should hit the middle of the channel on the 6th of June. The weather won't be great, but it'll be better than it has been. If we go on the 6th of June, it should give us just long enough to get 160,000 troops by air and by sea to land in Normandy. That night, Eisenhower goes back to his caravan in the woods about a mile behind this house. He has a restless night, but he comes back into the house just after four o'clock in the morning. Stagg has better news. He's much more certain the weather will be better. Montgomery still wants to go. Ramsey's persuaded. Lee Mallory is persuaded. After a short discussion at 19 minutes past four on the morning of the 5th of June, 1944, Eisenhower says three words. Okay, let's go. The planned region of invasion was Normandy, France. The region was divided into five landing zones, along with paratroopers and glider troops landing on the eastern and western flanks of the beaches. The sections of beach in the region were given code names. The American 4th Division would land on Utah Beach. The U.S. 29th and 1st Divisions would land on Omaha Beach. The British 50th would land on Gold Beach, and the 3rd would land on Sword Beach. The Canadian 3rd Division would attack Juneau Beach. Before the sea invasion, thousands of paratroopers from the American 82nd and 101st Airborne, along with the British 6th Airborne, with the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion, would land to capture roads and bridges to prevent German counterattack. The decision was set here in Southwark but were we ready? Ranger training uh, in England uh, was, uh, normally ranger training would last longer, but for us in a specialized situation, the 30 of us went through ranger training. It's strict infantry division, and also uh, uh, you learn to jump from uh, uh, C-47s, which uh, were troop carriers, and uh, you went to intensive training uh, and as well as the opportunity to observe actual infantry combat so that as a forward observer you had more of an appreciation of what it was like to be uh, an infantryman per se, so to speak. And uh, it was very beneficial and it really uh, was training that came in handy for me personally during the next uh, year's time. And three WAFs and three ATS and we did all the initial typing and working on the operation orders for Overlord. And they were being changed all the time because these were the orders for the Navy, the Army and the Air Force. And uh, naturally all the services, they were always having to change things. So that was, that was really hard work. And up to the, uh, the months, a few months before D-Day, we did extraordinary hours because they were running out of time. Um, we worked from, say, 6 a.m. to 12 noon, and then we were on duty again at 6 p.m. till midnight, and then on duty at 6 a.m. again. And so that went on. I don't know how long, how, how long we did that for, but it was, um, it was just non-stop. We'll pick it up again as soon as Wiley, Lucy, and Michael make it to the English coast and then cross the channel themselves. To recap, let's reveal the answer to the first poll question. This may surprise you, but the answer is D. The D in D-Day actually doesn't stand for anything. It's a code name that just means the day of invasion. Because the actual invasion day changed while the operation was being planned, it was easier to use this term than assigning an actual date and changing it on every document. The term HR was also used, meaning the hour of invasion. Now, I'd like to introduce Museum Vice President Colonel Peter Crane to provide some insight into D-Day and to answer your questions. So, Colonel, we know the D and D-Day didn't really stand for anything. 
uh, but we've heard both D-Day and Operation Overlord. Are these things the same? Actually, they're not. Operation Overlord was the code name for the overall Battle of Normandy, but Operation Neptune was the code name for the landings on June 6th. D-Day was full of code names to ensure everything remained top secret. The landing beaches were called Omaha, Utah, Gold, Sword, and Juno, and the code name for the overall deception plan was called Bodyguard. So what was the goal of deception plans? Well, deception was paramount to the success of D-Day. There are a lot of elements to strategy, like turning German spies or decoding German Enigma messages, but one of the most important elements was to ensure that the Germans didn't know where or when the crossing was going to take place. So dummy equipment was stationed in England, such as inflatable tanks and planes, trucks, etc. An entire fake military group was stationed in Dover. The Allies wanted the Germans to think that we were crossing at the narrowest part of the English Channel, the Pas de Calais, or through, no or through Norway. Uh, here's another element of the deception plan. Uh, something as simple as our little friend Rupert here. Rupert is a paratrooper dummy that was attached to a parachute and was dropped east of the real D-Day invasion site. These Ruperts were dressed in uniforms and of course had the parachute. Uh, they were equipped with uh, firecrackers so that when they hit the ground it would sound like gunfire going off. They appeared to be a formidable unit landing in the area. That is amazing. Now let's take some student questions. We've got uh, one question from Lafayette Elementary. How many troops could fit in a Higgins boat? Well, uh, your standard Higgins boat uh, could carry roughly a platoon, which was about 30 to 35 soldiers. Wow. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Let me, uh, I think we've got another question. Let me uh, go to the next student question. This is from Jonathan right here in New Orleans. How old was the average Allied soldier? You know, the average rifleman uh, that was hitting the beach that day is not much older than the students that are watching this, this uh, field trip right now. They were from about 17 years old to maybe as old as about 25, but most of them were teenagers or just past being teenagers. Kids. They were kids. Wow. Let's check back in with Wiley, Michael, and Lucy in Portsmouth. Looks like they're at the D-Day story about to check out the Overlord embroidery which is inspired by the Bayou Tapestry located in Normandy. This relates directly to our next poll question. What is the subject of the Bayou Tapestry? Your choices are A, the Norman Conquest of England, B, King Arthur's Quest for the Holy Grail, C, the Battle of Gallipoli, or D, the duel between Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. Okay, let's turn it over to our friends at the D-Day store. We're at the D-Day story in the city of Portsmouth. This museum keeps the story of D-Day alive, particularly the critical role Portsmouth, the region, and the entirety of England played in Operation Overlord. We're here to learn about how the Allies mobilized for the largest amphibious invasion in history. A better way to understand this is to explore the museum, including this amazing piece behind me called the Overlord Embroidery. Inspired by the Bayeux Tapestry of 1066, this piece depicts the Normandy invasion, measuring in at 272 feet. With us is Felicity Wood, the public participation officer at the D-Day Story. She's going to tell us a little bit more about the embroidery. So Felicity, who, who made it and how long did it take to make? So the embroidery was commissioned by a man called Lord Dulverton and he commissioned an artist called Sandra Lawrence, who was actually only 22 at the time. So she didn't really know a huge amount about the Second World War, so she had to do quite a lot of research before she could design it. Um, it was made by the Royal School of Needlework, and it took them five years to make. They started it in 1968, and it was finished in January 1974. Is it accurate what happened? So the design committee was made up of three senior army officers and a team of historians, and they all approved Sandra's designs, so none of the designs could actually be stitched until they'd signed them off. What can we learn about the Allied invasion from this embroidery? Um, we can learn a lot, and it's full of kind of interesting historical details. So, for example, the, the uh, panel behind us is actually based on a real photograph, and these three soldiers here are reading a booklet that they were issued with to tell them what life was like for um, French people under German occupation and kind of how to behave when they were in France. Um, so why don't we go outside and see what was next for the Allies.
So we're standing next to the Solent, which leads to the English Channel, and roughly 120 miles in that direction was the final destination for the Allied troops, which was Normandy in France. What was Portsmouth like the day before Dilo? The whole of the south of England would have been like one huge army camp and Portsmouth was part of those preparations for D-Day. So the troops and the navy that were marshalling here were heading to Sword Beach. And if you looked out across the channel, the eyewitnesses said there were so many ships and landing craft in the Solent, it looked like you could almost walk across them to the Isle of Wight. With the brief clearing in weather and Eisenhower's directive to go, he issued the order of the day to over 150,000 soldiers bound for Normandy. He reinforced the importance of their mission and the intense challenge they faced ahead. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. On the early morning of June 6th, a large fleet of ships carrying troops and supplies leaves England to commence its channel crossing. Today, we're going to embark across the channel and follow in the footsteps of the Allies 75 years ago. Shortly before midnight, British, Canadian and American paratroopers board C-47s and gliders, which will soon be on their way for an early morning drop in the region before the sea invasion begins. Through the middle of the night, the ships would make their journey across the channel. Eventually, the transport ships dropped the anchor roughly 11 miles off the coast of France. At around 3.30 in the morning, the assault forces climbed down rope ladders to board the Higgins boats and LCAs. Despite the slight break in weather, the seas were still choppy. Men from all nations got seasick as they approached the coast in their landing craft. However, this would be the least of their worries as the boats were given the signal to move in a few short hours. Bonjour et bienvenue. Je m'appelle Angie. That means hello and welcome. My name is Angie and I live in this region of France called Normandy. I also went to school in Saint Mary Glise. Bordering the English Channel, Normandy is one of France's 13 mainland regions and rich in beauty and history. Iconic sites decorate this region, from the Bayeux Tapestry to stunning medieval cities to quiet rural countryside, castles and cathedrals. This entire region has a violent past. William the Conqueror hailed from the city of Falaise. His bloody quest for English rule is well-known history. Joan of Arc was burned at the stake in the city of Rouen. And of course, 75 years ago, it became the site of the largest amphibious invasion in all of history. Allied soldiers poured onto the sand under heavy enemy fire and ranger scale these sheer cliffs. Further inland, skirmishes erupted in small villages to secure streets and bridges from the Nazi as French civilians took shelter. Similar as us planning for overlord for years, the German had been preparing for years. The Allies forces needed to open a new front in Northwest Europe to win this war. In anticipation of this critical battle, the Nazi constructed the Atlantic Wall. Now it's not an actual wall, but a series of defenses that extended from Norway to French border with Spain. The Atlantic Wall began construction in 1942 and work heavily ramped up in early 1944. That's really interesting. And what were the large gun emplacements used for? This is the Longstormer battery, probably the best preserved pieces of the Atlantic Wall defenses. Out of all defenses in Normandy, it's the only one to still be equipped with its original guns. The relics of these defense systems, of which there were hundreds along this coastline, serve as some of the most visible reminders of what took place here 75 years ago. 
12 miles out in that st storm that had blown up and the canceled the first day. Uh, it hadn't let down that day. The prediction was that it would uh, subside and it did because we made it ashore. But it was still very, very bad. And the people being seasick, it was such a stinking mess that that alone <laughs> was enough to kill a man from the stench of the diesel oil and the puke and it was, well, one thing that I was glad for, I was the first one off of that boat and being up front of the boat and it moving, all the wind went to the back. And uh, so the men further in the, in the back are the ones who got the smell because that, I didn't get any of it. A long ride, rough ride, drenched, cold into the, into the, the beach. And they, they put me in the reconnaissance troop, which were very light tanks. They were the Stewart tank. And um, I was a gunner operator. So then I was with them on D-Day. And we departed from um, Southampton. And we, it was very impressive because crossing of the channel and we, we woke up in the morning and there were, I mean, thousands of ships from, and the reassuring thing was there's, there's no way anybody could stop this invasion. I mean, it just, uh, once it got going, there was so much of it. Great mission. I remember saying to the guys, that if you have to go down in the channel, don't worry about it. You could walk back to England on the ships. There are that many of them. Unbelievable number. What a job that was to put together. The Long Sumer Battery is an impressive sight. It is so well preserved many years after the war. Now, let's reveal the answer to the last poll question. The answer is A the Norman conquest of England. You heard Angie review the rich history of Normandy and mention William the Conqueror's takeover of England. As you heard, William the Conqueror hails from Falaise, and you'll see an interview with Angie in that city later in the webcast. Let's bring it back to World War II. Colonel Crane joins us again to take a look at examples of airborne uniforms from D-Day. Colonel. Well, Damon, here we have two uniforms that would have been worn by paratroopers uh, during the invasion. This is an American uniform. Now, American paratroopers had a different uniform than the rest of our infantry. Uh, you'll notice uh, some things that are different is that it has more pockets, and the pockets that are on the top are angled, which made it easier for the paratroopers to get at while they were in their harness. Right. Uh, the other thing that you'll notice is the British one over here. This is a, called a jump smock. The British paratroopers wore the same uniform that their regular infantrymen wore, mm -hmm. but they'd put this jump smock over the top, which made it easier to get in and out of their parachute. Then once the parachute was off, it was camouflaged and then also served to protect them from the elements. Wow. And so, Colonel, we also have um, in our pockets these little um, crickets, are they called? They're called crickets. The, the 101st Airborne Division carried these, these crickets. Uh, they, they were used as a countersign to help identify if there were any other paratroopers in the area without giving away their position to the enemy. If I click this cricket once and I hear two clicks back, then I knew there was a friend nearby. The cricket sounds blended in with the real crickets and the real noises of Normandy, so hopefully it wouldn't alert the Germans that were in the surrounding area. Wow. Thanks, Colonel. So let's take a look at some student questions. We have a question from Mike. Were there any Medal of Honor recipients at D-Day? There were. The, on the American side, in the entire campaign of Normandy, there were 12 recipients of the Medal of Honor. And even on D-Day alone, uh, in, with their Commonwealth troops, there was a, a, a gentleman named Stanley Hollis who received the, uh, the Commonwealth equivalent of the Medal of Honor, the Victoria Cross. So we have another question from uh, Echo School District. How long did D-Day last? 
Well, D-Day signifies that it lasted for 24 hours and with the first paratroopers landing shortly after midnight. But the campaign in Normandy went on for a couple more weeks. So it, it's, it, it's more than just one day, but the Operation Neptune was just the 24 hours. Got it. Thank you, Colonel. Before we join our students in Normandy, let's take a look at the next poll. How many Allied countries participated in the Normandy invasion? Your choices are A, 3, B, 4, C, 12, or D, 27. Now we'll turn to Angie, who is going to kick off the exploration of this 45-mile battlefront. Because the Normandy region is large and D-Day is complex, we decided to split up to explore important sites for each country. Starting off the investigation is Michael in the town of St. Mary Glees. We begin our story with the pre-dawn invasion by American and British paratroopers. Their mission, to capture roads and bridges on the eastern and western flanks of the beaches to prevent German reinforcements from moving into the area. Over 9,000 C-47 Skytrains towing gliders and carrying more than 13,000 paratroopers from the American 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions, the British 6th Airborne Division, and the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion took off from various bases in southern England and crossed the channel, dropping forces behind enemy lines in the wee hours of the morning. The 82nd Airborne Division dropped in and around the village of St. Mary Glees. With me is Magalie Millet from the Airborne Museum to talk a little bit about what happened that day. So, did everything go to plan for the Allies that day? Not exactly, for the paratroopers, not exactly, because, you know, it was a very bad weather for D-Day. And um, here, especially, we have uh, marshlands, and the German uh, flooded all the marshlands, so it was very difficult for the paratroopers to, uh, to jump, and some of them were drawn in the marshlands. So many paratroopers were scattered everywhere, uh, around St. Marie Glees, St. Marie du Mont. And sometimes they were, they were dropped maybe 20 or 30 kilometers from here. So it was not exactly the plan. Wow. What's with the church in the background, especially the paratrooper hanging off the side of it? Um, this, this man, this American 82nd Airborne paratrooper, the name of this man is John Steele. And John Steele is, was in, um, in the stick that jumped over St. Mary Glees. And John Steele were, um, received a bullet in his, feet, in his foot during his, um, his jump, and he was not able to control his parachute. So he was anchored on the chair steeple. And at that time, you always have German troops in the steeple because it's a good point to observe what happened. So you have two Germans in the steeple and the German took John Steele with them. He was their prisoner for three days and fortunately after that he, he was able to escape. Wow, that's so interesting. <laughs> so overall, were the Allied paratroopers successful? Yes. We, we are used to say that um, Utah Beach is a successful landings thanks to the paratroopers because they complete all the objective. They gain control onto St. Mary Glees, they gain control on Lafia Bridge, and also they were able to secure the exits of Utah Beach, so to secure the landings. So thanks to them, it was a success at Utah Beach. Wow. Well, thank you, Megali. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So now we're going to go to a place where we can see both Utah Beach and Omaha Beach. I'm standing here at Point du Hoc, a prominent observation point between Omaha and Utah Beach. At approximately 0630 hours, the first American troops landed on Omaha Beach, the most heavily defended by German forces. Surrounded by steep elevation, the attacking Americans faced intense German opposition. In order to get off the beach and push further ahead, 
the Americans had to capture narrow beach exits or causeways that led inland to the Norman countryside. This site earned the name Bloody Omaha as roughly half of the Allied casualties occurred on this one beach on June 6. Some men didn't even make it to the beach itself. A combination of rising tides and scared young Higgins boat pilots caused many of the infantry to be dropped far offshore. The men had to wade through the water with packs weighing anywhere from 80 to 120 pounds on their back. Despite initial confusion and an extreme loss of life, a small number of units managed to knock out German defenses, secure the beach exits, and move inland. Point to Hawk was believed to be a German stronghold. Allied intelligence suggested that this was a location for the German gun emplacements that would threaten the Allied beaches and had to be destroyed. Here, you can see signs of heavy Allied bombardment. Huge craters decorate this landscape. The American 2nd Ranger Battalion landed here, scaled these 100-foot cliffs, but didn't initially find the German weaponry. They moved further inland, discovered the transported artillery pieces, and destroyed them. Further to the west of me is Utah Beach, taken by the 4th Infantry Division. Not in the original plans for D-Day, it was a late addition for its proximity to the port city of Cherbourg. The force landed further east from original plans, but the defensive fire was light. Once troops advanced further inland, they were slowed down by flooding, but eventually met up with members of the 101st Airborne by nightfall. Now let's check in with Lucy to see what was going on with the British on June 6th. I'm standing here at the beautiful lookout of Aumange Le Bon, and to my right is Gold Beach, which was assigned to the British 50th Division. Landing at 7.25 in the morning, this beach and the surrounding towns were captured quickly by the British after a short, sharp fight. Some fighting continued along the area behind the beach until morning, with roughly a thousand British casualties. German forces had been holed up in housing along the coast, which was heavily damaged or destroyed by naval gunfire. The Long Siemer Battery, where we were earlier, served as a German observation post for Gold Beach, but its guns had also been put out of commission by British bombardment from the sea. In the distance, you can see the remains of Mulberry Harbour, which, like another harbour on Omaha Beach, turned this coastline into a temporary port during the war. On D-Day, British troops deliberately didn't land here so that they could keep this beach clear. The pieces of the harbour were tugged over from England and put in place at Aramange. What we see remaining are the landing pontoons and floating roadways that could bring supplies and equipment to the beaches and then further inland to support the ground campaign. In the five months this harbour was used, 500,000 vehicles and 4 million tonnes of supplies, along with 2.5 million men, reached the Normandy region. It was crucial to the success of the invasion. Further east is the second British landing spot, codenamed Sword. The mission of the British 3rd Division that day, meet up with the British paratroopers and take the city of Caen. The forces moved inwards relatively quickly, linked up with the paratroopers but faced stiff resistance by German tankers. Although still a success, by the end of the day, Allied forces were still five miles from Caen. Now let's toss it to Wiley, who's exploring Judo Beach. Behind me is Juno Beach. The original codename for this beach was Jelly, as in jellyfish, swordfish, and goldfish. However, the planners didn't think that that was a serious enough name for such an important operation, so they changed it to Juno. Right now, we're at the Juno Beach Center. This museum commemorates the role that Canada played during the Second World War, especially for those that were killed in the Battle of Normandy and D-Day. Right now, we're steps from Juno Beach itself, where 359 Canadians died on June 6, 1944. With me is Alicia Dottawali from the Juno Beach Center. Hi Alicia, how are you? I'm doing great, how are you? Good, thank you. Thank you for joining me today. My so I was just wondering if you could walk us through what exactly happened here 75 years ago and what kinds of challenges the Canadian troops faced? Absolutely. So the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division stormed Juneau Beach at about 7.55 in the morning of D-Day. So 
So that was about 10 minutes past H hour. And the troops were supported by the tanks from the 2nd Canadian Armoured Brigade, as well as the artillery and other units attached to the division. And because low tide had already passed, um, some of the German beach obstacles were already partially submerged under the water. This created an incredibly dangerous situation for the incoming landing craft, as there, were no, there was no telling as to where the obstacles were located as they were partially already covered. Um, as a result, about 30% of the landing craft were either partially damaged or completely destroyed even before they arrived onto the beach. And were the Canadian troops successful? Despite heavy losses in the first wave, um, the Canadians persevered and they captured the bridgehead and as well as a few of the surrounding villages. And the Canadians were able to link up with the British troops at Gold Beach, and, but they were still a few miles away from those at Sword. But it's also worth noting that the Canadians advanced farther inland than any other troops on D-Day. Wow, that's an amazing story. Thank you very much. D-Day is an excellent example of how sacrifice, bravery, and teamwork can turn the tide of a war. Many nations, along with the intelligence and cooperation of the French resistance, paved the way for an entire army to be brought to shore in one day, never to be dislodged. We began to see uh, the uh, anti-aircraft uh, guns. Then we were waiting for the green light, and, as, and we saw the pasture land passing underneath us. It just, uh, it appeared like uh, a, a very uh, peaceful, uh, uh, pastoral uh, uh, area below us. Little did we know that the land that we were approaching was absolutely underwater. When we got the green light, went out, we were flying at a very low level, at least my plane was, and uh, I went out and got about one full oscillation of my, uh, par after opening of my parachute, and I hit the water and went under. And this was a great surprise to me because uh, I thought I was going to be landing in a pasture land. When our ramp went down, the signal for every machine gun on that beach to open up on the exit to our ship. So Harold Donaldson, the lieutenant, was gunned down in the boat, like you see in Saving Private Ryan. The fellow in front of me, Clarice Riggs, was machine gunned on the ramp. I dove in behind him. Only my left side of my helmet was creased by a bullet. I hit the sand behind the hedgehog, which is about 130 yards from the seawall. And uh, I observed to my right uh, Private Robert Dittmar, Fairfield, Connecticut. I was yelling, uh, laying. he tripped over the hedgehog, spun completely around, lying on his back and yelling, I'm hit, I'm hit, mom, mother, and then he was silent. Just a short time after that, a man crawled up on my right side and uh, I saw what he was doing. He had a Bangalore in two sections and he was putting it under the barbed wire. and. Uh, which he managed to do, pulled the fuse on it to light the primer, backed up a little bit, and I braced myself for the Bangalore to go off, and it didn't go off. He crawled back up and removed that bad lighter, put a new one in it, pulled the string on it, started to back up, and at that second he was hit, and his eyes looked directly at the end of mine. And, and, and uh, with a, the look in, the, in his eyes as he died and was uh, uh, a questioning look or a puzzling look. It's hard to describe. And then his eyes just closed. Uh, uh, to me, that man was the greatest hero on that beach because that Bangalore went off and when it went off, I was up and through that wire. That was some powerful testimony and stories of survival from those who were there 75 years ago. Let's actually bring in Colonel Crane to answer the previous poll question. 
Colonel Crane, how many allied nations actually participated in D-Day? You know, although we're focusing on four countries in this program, actually a dozen nations played a role in this massive undertaking that's known as D-Day. For example, an Australian air crew in the Royal Air Force would serve in many different roles, including towing gliders or on bomber runs, and two Greek warships were part of the massive armada in the channel. There are countless other examples. I bet there are. So let's talk about another lesser known story of a nation participating in D-Day. In this case, the American Indian Comanche Nation. These men were utilized as code talkers, creating an organized code and using their language to send messages from the beach. Colonel, is that pretty accurate? Sure is. This is one of the great history stories of Native American culture. There were 13 Comanche code talkers who landed on Utah Beach with the 4th Infantry Division. The Comanches didn't have words in their language for modern military terms, so they created code to communicate with one another on the battlefield. They used their coded native language to send messages via radios and telephones and then translated them back into English. The first message in Comanche from Utah Beach was, we made a good landing, we landed in the wrong place. These codes, along with the codes from the Navajo code talkers in the Pacific, were never broken by the enemy. That is fascinating. So Colonel, let's take some student questions. We have a question from uh, MP Middle School. Why would gliders be used? Well, if you use gliders, you could get more troops to the ground quickly. You'd have 13 on that, and then you could also drop people out of the planes that were towing them. Wow. Let's uh, answer another question from some of our viewers. This one from uh, Mont Montvideo Middle School. How many Allied casualties were there on D-Day? Well, the quick answer to that is no one will ever really know. But, and that's one of those questions that's been argued forever. But there were over 4,500 alone. Uh, and on Juneau Beach and Omaha Beach were the worst. There were roughly 1,200 on Juneau Beach, and there were about 2,500 on Omaha Beach. It was a huge loss of life. Absolutely. Now it's time to reveal our last poll question for the day. Are you ready? How long did it take Allied forces to liberate the Normandy region? Your choices are A, one day, B, two weeks, C, two and a half months, D, eight months. Let's join Angie again to learn about the civilian experience in Normandy during World War II. A quick note, the beginning of this segment will be in French, so be sure to read the subtitles. In the last segment, we reviewed the fierce fighting that took place on the D-Day beaches and the sacrifices of the Allied forces invading this region. In addition to the casualties on both sides of the conflict, the war robbed civilian population caught in the crossfire. I am now at the Civilians in Water Memorial Museum in Falaise, France. This is a unique museum dedicated to the lives of regular people as their world is appended by war and conflict. Towns were bombarded before and after the invasion. Civilians tried to find protection and safety underground, with many losing their homes or even entire towns. In the Battle for Normandy alone, 20,000 victims lost their lives and thousands more will become war refugees. Le Memorial des Civils dans la guerre a été construit sur une maison en ruine qui a été bombardée en 1944. Je suis maintenant avec Emmanuel Thiebaud du musée qui va nous parler un peu de cette maison. Donc, euh, qu'est-ce que vous pouvez nous dire sur cette maison en particulier Alors, en fait, c'est une maison qui a été découverte lorsque le mémorial a été construit, il y a maintenant plus de trois ans. Nous avons euh, agrandi euh, par rapport au bâtiment existant euh, pour faire un bâtiment nouveau. Et en faisant les travaux, nous avons découvert ce que nous voyons sous nos pieds, c'est-à-dire les vestiges de l'ancienne maison qui existait ici à cet emplacement pendant la Seconde Guerre mondiale et qui a été détruite en 1944. C'est une maison qui a appartenu euh, au début du XXe siècle à un monsieur qui était très connu à Falaise, qui était un docteur, le docteur Turgis, et la maison euh, a gardé ce nom d'ailleurs de maison Turgis pour la désigner tant euh, elle était imposante dans la ville. On n'est pas très loin de l'hôtel de ville, on est vraiment sur la place centrale de Falaise et au cours de l'été 1944, eh bien, pendant les bombardements, cette maison a été complètement anéantie et détruite. Et après-guerre, 
plutôt que de reconstruire la maison à l'identique, eh bien, la municipalité de Falaise a fait le choix de reconstruire un autre bâtiment qui complétait la mairie, un autre bâtiment administratif, puisque en fait, le bâtiment dans lequel aujourd'hui nous nous trouvons, qui est devenu le mémorial des civils dans la guerre, est l'ancien tribunal administratif de Falaise. Euh, donc, quand vous nous parlez de ça, on pense évidemment à la situation des civils. Donc, comment est-ce qu'ils s'en sont sortis durant l'occupation alors en fait, l'occupation était évidemment très dure pour les populations civiles. Il ne faut pas oublier en fait un fait très principal, c'est que les Allemands en occupant la France occupent un pays riche. Et ce qui va importer pendant 4 ans aux Français, c'est le pillage économique du pays. Qui dit pillage économique du pays à leur profit, au profit de l'effort de guerre allemand, signifie qu'il reste de moins en moins de choses, de matières premières à redistribuer au reste de la population. Si bien que pendant 4 ans, et très rapidement dès l'automne 1940, la population se trouve soumise à toute une série de pénuries, restrictions, ravitaillements qui ne s'arrêteront jamais pendant toute la période de la guerre. Il va devenir très difficile de se nourrir, de se vêtir, de se déplacer et... Ajoutez à cela que toutes vos libertés individuelles et collectives par la pression de toutes les lois et ordonnances allemandes, mais aussi du gouvernement de Vichy qui va aussi contraindre la population, fait qu'au final, en résumé, on pourrait dire que pendant 4 ans, la population française s'est trouvée dans une prison à ciel ouvert. D'accord. Donc on imagine qu'ils étaient sous tension. Et quelle a été euh, la réaction des civils quand ils ont vu les alliés débarquer Est-ce qu'ils s'entendaient avec ou est-ce que c'était plutôt tendu On le voit dans les archives, il y a des militaires des fois euh, qui écrivent dans leur rapport euh, « On est venu libérer les Français, euh, mais on ne se sent pas accueilli à bras ouverts ». Alors il est vrai que lorsque vous avez perdu tous vos biens, eh bien, vous êtes à la fois évidemment content que l'occupation allemande cesse, mais triste parce que eh bien, euh, vous allez avoir du temps à vous redresser et à, vous, euh, à reprendre une vie normale. D'accord. Et donc on imagine que les civils ont, ont mis du temps à s'en remettre. Donc quelles ont été euh, leurs premières réactions et leurs premiers souvenirs à l'évocation des, des campagnes normandes alors en fait, euh, ce qui est très intéressant et important aussi à signaler, c'est de s'apercevoir que euh, les civils qui ont été, on le comprend bien aussi, les grandes victimes de cette Seconde Guerre mondiale, rappelons qu'il y a eu plus, pour la première fois dans un conflit de l'histoire, plus de morts civiles que de militaires, et malgré tout, dans toutes les commémorations qui avaient lieu après-guerre, eh bien c'était plutôt le fait militaire qui était commémoré et les civils qui étaient un petit peu les oubliés de cette histoire, de cette commémoration et de cette libération. Et il faut attendre les années 80-80, pour que enfin réapparaisse la mémoire de ces populations civiles, des souffrances qu'ils avaient endurées pendant ces combats de la libération. Et c'est à ce moment-là que la parole va se libérer, qu'on va entendre les civils qui vont aussi avoir quelque chose à nous raconter, un témoignage à nous porter et une autre expérience de la guerre euh, à nous permettre de découvrir. Merci pour votre temps et merci, merci de nous avoir accueillis dans votre musée. Merci bien. Je vais maintenant aller rejoindre les autres reporters au cimetière américain de Colville. Today we're at the Normandy American Cemetery, Visitor Center, and Memorial. This place, which looks out to Omaha Beach, serves as a reminder for the cost of D-Day and all of World War II. Over one million visitors from across the globe travel to this place every year. It was the first American cemetery on European soil in World War II. Over 9,000 individuals are remembered here by these beautifully kept graves of those who lost their lives in the Battle of Normandy. Here we also have the walls of the missing for those who have perished, but their remains have not been recovered. The rosettes marking some of these names indicate those who have been officially identified. We were at the grave of Private First Class Jack Powers, one of thousands of Americans who lost their lives in the battle for Normandy. Jack, along with his older brother Clyde, stormed Omaha with Company A of the 116th Infantry Regiment. Both were residents of Bedford, Virginia, with roughly 30 other men who participated in Operation Overlord. As the day closed on June the 6th, 1944, 19 men from Bedford, Virginia lost their lives. In the small town of 3,200, it was a devastating loss of life. In fact, it was actually the largest loss of life per capita in any American town. The Powers were at one set of free group of brothers from Bedford who were sent to the shore in the first wave of D-Day. These men weren't the only group of brothers to storm these shores. George, Albert and Thomas Westlake from Toronto were killed within only four days of each other and are buried together 
in the Beni sur Mer Cemetery behind Juno Beach. Jack enjoyed singing, dancing the jitterbug, and playing his guitar. On D Day, fellow veterans recall that the usually calm Jack was tense as he boarded the landing craft to get him to shore. Eyewitnesses say that he died instantly on the beach. His brother returned back home to Bedford with intense sadness and guilt without Jack by his side. Today we remember Jack, the Bedford boys, and thousands of other Allied troops who lost their lives in the Battle of Normandy. Today we remember them and let them rest in peace. I, I couldn't say in what way it was positive, except that I know that I wasn't the same bod coming out as I was going in. I didn't look at things the same way. I didn't feel things in the same way. But why that was, I don't know. It's strange. I've often wondered about that. But I suppose if you see violent death, enough times, you get used to it. That must be it, because otherwise it drive you mad. You know, there are none of our boys alive now, but, well, I miss them, but I feel grateful that I've lived so long, really. And it'd be nice to be able to get together with them again. I hope I go to heaven and that I'll, I'll, I'll meet them there. They were, they were courageous and kind and caring. Uh, <clears throat> being a loyal Texan and American, uh, it just uh, was my duty to defend my country and fight for my country. Uh, People have asked me, well, over the years, uh, Frank, did you fight for apple pie and, and uh, uh, mom's uh, cooking? And uh, actually, when you become a combat soldier, you fight for your buddies. And you fight for the guys that you are in the same unit with, and you fight for each other, and you fight for your objective. So, I. I know that I'm a very patriotic person. Uh, I love my country, I love my state, I love the opportunities that it affords the people of our country. And one of the core values that I have and always will have is the freedom that our country provides our people. What a powerful remembrance of this important day in history. Here's the answer to the final poll question. It's C, two and a half months. Colonel Crane, we're almost out of time. So I only have one more question for you. Why should we remember D-Day so many years later? Well, Damon, the Normandy invasion was one of the great turning points of the 20th century in history. An immense army was placed in Nazi-occupied Europe, never to be dislodged. Germany was threatened that same month by a huge Soviet invasion from the east that would reach the gates of Berlin by the following April. The way to appreciate D-Day's importance is to contemplate what would have happened if it had failed. Another landing would not have been possible for at least a year. Uh, this would have given Hitler time to move soldiers to the east, to strengthen the Atlantic Wall, to harass England with the newly developed V-1 flying bombs and V-2 rockets, to continue to develop jet aircraft and other so-called miracle weapons, and of course, accel accelerate the Holocaust. This world may have looked very different if the invasion was not a success. It's another prime example of how history ultimately shapes the world we live in today. This museum, along with other museums and historic sites we visited today, look to preserve that history for generations to analyze, debate, and appreciate. With that, we're completely out of time today. I want to thank Colonel Crane for his insight into the Normandy invasion. Bravo to our student reporters, Michael, Wiley, Lucy, and Angie. Teachers, if you'd like to dive in further to the story of D-Day, curriculum materials are available on the National World War II Museum's website. Oh. 
I'd also like to say thank you and merci beaucoup to our filming partners in southern England and Normandy, France, for welcoming us into your museums and historic sites to capture these stories, including Suttick House, the D-Day story, the American Battle Monuments Commission, and the Civilians and Wartime Memorial, the Juneau Beach Center, and the Airborne Museum. Lastly, our gratitude to the sponsors who made this international program possible. With that, I'm Commander Damon Singleton. And I'm Colonel Pete Crane. And we're signing off from the National World War II Museum. Au revoir.